Hello, hello and welcome. Hopefully all of you can hear me. Um, we will start now with the webinar. My name is Michael Schöneich and today we want to talk about a little bit about evolved gas analysis, so how we could detect and identify evolved gases in the field of thermal analytic experiments. In the upcoming next minutes, um, I will give you a brief introduction about what is evolved gas analysis, why we want to do this in the field of thermal analysis. Further on, we will talk a little bit about how we could technically achieve evolved gas analysis solution. And further on, we will go more in detail about three common solutions, which are infrared spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, and GCMS coupling. Okay. But let's now start with the brief introduction. Um, as you hopefully know, the company Natch is one of the leading um, suppliers of thermal analytic instruments and therefore all our applications examples uh, are always in connection with thermal analytic experiments. For people among you which are maybe not completely familiar with thermal analysis, please let me shortly describe what it is. More or less, it is any kind of techniques where you characterize a material or the properties of a material in dependence of a temperature. So this means if you cool something or heat something or just isothermal treat a sample and you look at their properties, for instance, their length change, their mass change or their heat capacity, this is more or less all thermal analysis. If you need more information about this, please head to our homepage, netthermalanalysis.com. Um, because there you get more information, because this is not the topic today. Today we want to talk about evolved gas analysis, and therefore in the application part we will mainly focus on thermogravimetric analysis, which is one of these techniques in the thermal analysis field, one of the common ones, where you look for the mass changes while we apply a temperature program on our substance. And just for understanding, let's have shortly look how such a thermal analyzing machine in principle will work. So we will have a balance where we can detect the mass change of the substance. We will have a support where we can place our sample on the balance. And of course, we need a temperature profile and therefore we have a furnace to heat, to cool or just isothermal treat the sample. This is a quite common technique and typically you will end up with curves like you see here in the lower part. So the mass curve or the mass change curve of the sample over the temperature profile you have applied to the sample and typically you end up with distinct mass loss steps or mass gain steps um, at certain temperature points. This is a quite good point because um, because um, you see that you have a distinct mass change at a distinct temperature point. But normally, if you have an unknown sample, you have a problem that you don't know what's coming out of a sample. So the main problem is you don't know what is cause, causing this mass loss step. And this is the point where the Evolve gas analysis comes into play. Evolve gas analysis, in principle, is just the nature or that the, the analysis of the nature or the amount of gases evolved by the substances. So what we do if we want to combine this evolved gas analysis with the, our thermogravimetric analyzer, we just apply a collecting or transferring system at the end of the outlet of the furnace and transfer all the released gases of our sample to the evolved gas analyzer. That's simple in principle and as a result, you still get, of course, the, uh, the TG or the mass change curve of the thermobalance. And now with the evolved gas analyzer, you can look at the distinct mass loss steps at the gases which were released there. And then, for instance, for this example here in the lower part, you would get information that the first step is referring to water release. The second step is referring to a release of carbon monoxide. And the last step, is referring to release of carbon dioxide. And this is more or less the benefit of evolved gas analysis in the field of thermal analysis. It just gives you additional information um, beyond the point of uh, the normal thermal analyzer. So here we now have a distinct information when something happens and with the evolved gas analysis, now we know what happens there. In principle, this is already everything you need to know from the channel, from the theoretical point about Evolve Gas Analysis. Therefore, let's head over to how we 
do this on the hardware side. So let's have an overview about the Wolf Gas Analyzer solutions. Typically, in the common market, you will face three coupling solutions or hyphenated techniques, like they are also called. Um, they are, for instance, infrared spectroscopy, so FDIR coupling. We have mass spectrometer coupling, short MS systems, and for complex samples, we have the GCMS coupling, which is just a combination of a separator and a uh, gas analyzer. In principle, all three of these techniques have advantages and disadvantages. They have application fields, for instance, in inorganics, or some uh, coupling techniques are better than others, vice versa, in organic field, others have advantages. To give this a more overview or more insight for you, we will now go through each of these three methods more in detail so that you understand in principle how it works and what are the limitations and what are the benefits of each of them. Let's start with the FDIR coupling, the infrared coupling. Infrared spectroscopy in general, uh, exploits the fact that the molecule absorbs um, specific energies of light or frequencies of light based on their structures. So more or less, we shoot some light with a distinct uh, wavelength on a molecule. And if we hit the wavelength, the energy of the bondings of this molecule, we will enhance a vibration inside of the molecule and the energy will be absorbed. Based on the resulting absorption spectra, we can then use these information for identification of the present um, molecules or gases. The advantage of this one is that these absorption spectra are more or less fingerprints, especially for functional groups in the organic field or also for inorganic gases. This allows, in principle, for an easy interpretation because more or less you end up with a spectra comparison of your vapor spectra with library spectra. And it is a non-destructive analysis. This means the gases will pass through the spectrometer and can be used for any other kind of application further on. For instance, you could also combine FDIR coupling with GCMS coupling at the same time to get even more information out of your uh, materials. Of course, you don't have only advantages on a technique. It has also some limitations. And the main limitation on the FDIR coupling is that you don't can measure anything because um, you need a so-called dipole moment to activate this vibration inside of molecules. And unfortunately, symmetric molecules don't have such a dipole. So you can't measure, for instance, hydrogen or noble gases like helium, but also nitrogen and oxygen not with FDIR spectroscopy. So if you're interested, for instance, in hydrogen release, this is just not the technique for you. Further on, this FDIR spectroscopy has a smaller linear range and a lower sensitivity in comparison to other techniques which are used especially in comparison to the mass spectrometer uh, systems. And this means smaller linear range, you have to put more effort to calibrate your system and therefore in principle quantification is just a little bit more difficult. And lower sensitivity means you are here typically in the mid PPM range for um, the sensitivity of your signal. This is still quite good, but for instance, if you are in this mass spectrometer systems, you are typically working in lower than one ppm, sometimes in the PPB range or lower. So in principle, this is a good start. It is also the most cheapest way to go into Ewolf gas analysis, by the way. From the technical side, you will mainly face two types of coupling solutions. Um, the first one is the most common ones, the transfer line coupling. This is more or less like the theoretical approach, which I mentioned before. You just collect the gases at the outline with a transfer line, you transfer it to the spectrometer. And you have a direct coupling where the spectrometer sits more or less directly on the outlet of the furnace. So here you see the transfer line a little bit more in detail with a schematic screen. And like mentioned, we collect the gas directly on the furnace outlet and transfer it to the detector cell of the FDIR. But the interesting point is that this transfer line or transfer way must be heated all over the place because otherwise you will get condensation. And condensation means everything of gas which is condensed cannot anymore be detected and therefore you get just misinformations about your gas composition. 
the heating of this transfer line is achieved by first of all an adapter system on the outlet of the furnace so we heat already the outlet of the furnace then you have the transfer line itself um, which is more or less a steel or ptfe tubing and then guided by a heating system and of course also the cell inside of the ftr system is heated normally these systems are heated in around about 200 to 300 degrees depending on the application also from the technical part in comparison the direct coupling is similar but a little bit different. So in principle for the direct coupling, we still have here in the middle part our furnace outlet and we have on top of it the FTIR spectrometer. And in principle, we have also a transfer line, but in this case, it's a quite short one. So we limit the time amount and also the volume amount on um, the transfer line. So we also limit in this case, the condensation possibility, but nevertheless, also this small part, which is round about only 10 centimeters, is must still be heated in the same way like the furnace outlet and the cell of the FTIR is heated. From application part, let's have a look how this is working for the FTIR coupling. So here we have a common polymeric example it's ethylene vinyl acetate or short eva like it's for instance used in soles of shoe or any other application um, you see on top part the structure and on the screen of the graphs you see three curves the black one is here the tg curve this is the mass change curve coming from the thermal balance system the green one is the DTG curve, it's a derivative of the mass change, so also a signal from the thermal balance. And finally, you have here the blue signal in the lower part marked with GS, standing for Gram Schmidt, which is more or less the summation signal of the infrared spectrometer. So what you see here in the first one is that you have mass loss steps, obviously, and that for each mass loss step, you get an according signal response from the FTIR. So this means our gases which are released during these decomposition steps are infrared active, so they are not hydrogen or nitrogen or something like this. If we want to get more information what is really happening, for instance, here at 350 degrees C, we need to go to the FTIR data. This FTIR data are typically presented in such a 3D cube. This 3D cube is consisting of three axes. One is a wave number, so this is the spectra, which we are more or less scanning with the infrared spectrometer. We have the temperature. Um, this is just the temperature of our thermal balance, so the thermal analytic temperature treatment and the intensity. So more or less this tube is consisting of many continuously measured spectra stacked along the temperature axis. For analysis, we cut now this cube at certain temperature points, for instance, our 350 degrees C, this red line here, and we will end up with extracted spectra out of this cube here shown in red at 355 in this case and we can now compare this against library spectra and in this case we have compared it against one of the common libraries from NIST and we get as library hit acetic acid quite good comparison or correspondence so this means we release here now acetic acid if we look on the structure on our EVA this is more or less obvious because in the first step, we just cut off the side chain here. So we release the side chain, we release the acetic acid and the residual after the first mass loss step is just the hydrocarbon backbone, um, which can then be further heated and treated. And this is what happens in the second step. So first step, acetic acid released. Now we treat the residual backbone and this will also decompose. And the main decomposition step is now at 470 degrees C. So let's look also in the spectra at 470, 73 degrees C here. And of course, this can also be found in a database comparison. And in this case, the comparison is not a distinct substance because this what spectra is not referring to a distinct gas. It's more referring to a mixture of gas because if you have such a hydrocarbon backbone, you can fragmentated in many, many smaller um, C molecules from, for instance, C5 to C20 or even further. But you can still compare it against hydrocarbon decomposition. In this case, for instance, the decomposition or pyrolysis of polyethylene, PE, and you see it's quite good comparison. But this is not the end. Um, we now, in principle, know what happens at each step because we have cutted this cube along the temperatures. However, if you have such a cube, 
we can obviously cut them also in the other direction. So we can cut them along certain wave numbers or wave number ranges along the temperature axis. And what we end up is the last slide for this example. Um, it is a comparison of our TG signal. We already discussed Gram-Schmidt signal from the FTR system. Now we have two more, the red and the purple one. The red one is referring to the wave absorption wave bands of acetic acid, and the purple one is referring to the absorption bands of the hydrocarbons um, molecules. And what you see here is that the response of the FTIR in the first step is really coming only to the bands referring to the acetic acid, while the second part is only coming from the bands referring to hydrocarbons. So with the help of these FTIR analysis, we now know what each of these master steps is referring to. And of course, from the TG, we can also really quantify the amounts of each of these steps. But the FDIR coupling is not only working in the organic or polymeric field. We see here in the second example for the FDIR coupling in the inorganic field. Here we have a mineral, topaz, which is typically an aluminosilicate system with some impurities of fluorine and hydrox hydrox hydroxide groups. And here we just show you the high temperature regions. In the high temperature regions, you see a mass loss step for these kind of minerals. And typically, you would not expect that if you don't know that they're inside are fluorines. But with the help of the FTIR, you can just distinctly look. And here we see just the traces of these hydrogen fluorine or silicium fluorine. And you see then that the high temperature mass loss is just only referring to this fluorine release, more or less, instead of any kind of, for instance, uh, oxidation or reduction processes inside of the material. Perfect. Let's close the FDIR coupling because we have some more techniques to be discussed today. So let's head into the next one, the mass spectrometer coupling. Mass spectrometer is just an analytic technique. It's the same like FDIR, but in this case, we just ionize our material, our gases, and then we sort them, these ions, by their mass charge ratio. So in principle, you see here the principal construction of so-called quadrupole mass spectrometer. So you have an ion source, your gases get in this ion source, they get ionized typically uh, by electron impact ionization. And then these ions are directed to a quadrupole system where inside of this quadrupole is an electric field. And with this electric field, you can select distinct mass to charge ratios and transfer them to the detector where you can just get the information about the amount of each of this mass to charge ratio. The benefit of this technique is that this is fast and high efficient. So for instance, scanning one of these mass to charge ratios takes around about 10 milliseconds or even less. On the other side, you directly get still by this fast scanning speed, high sensitivity. So as mentioned here, we are normally below one PPM in the detection limit. Um, but the interesting point is this can be achieved with quite small amount of gas. So for these analyzers, you need just around about one milliliter per minute um, gas flow from your furnace outlet. All the other gases coming out of your furnace can be used for other kind of uh, analyzers. So for instance, you could utilize FTIR coupling and MS coupling at the same time based on the properties of the mass spectrometer coupling. And finally, it has a high linearity of concentration. Uh, this means here you can, in principle, quite easy calibrate your system. In principle, you can even work with one point calibrations and still get useful information about the quantity of the released gases. Nevertheless, the system has also one drawback. And the main drawback, especially in the common uh, application field, is that due to the common electron impact ionization, we face the problem of fragmentation. This means one molecule will not give one signal, it more or less gives many signals. And especially in mixtures, this signal can overlap and then it's hard to in interpret what gases was released because you don't know what fragment is referring to what uh, molecule or gas. Maybe for some of you now asking fragmentation, so I destroy my uh, material. Yes, this is really a destruction. And to understand what happens here, please let me give you a short example on a small 
common molecule for CO2, the carbon dioxide. So if you have electron impact ionization, you have just the point that you shoot an electron on your molecule, it will shoot out a second one and will ionize your molecule. And based on this ionization, you will end up with a certain mass to charge ratio. So for instance, for uh, the first or single um, ionization, you end up with mass 44, which is just the molar mass of the carbon dioxide. But in principle, there's also the probability that you have a double ionization, that you have a mass to charge ratio of two, 22. So already two signals for one molecule. Not so bad, but this is not all. Um, the next one is fragmentation. This means because you have put it in electrons into the uh, molecule, you have put it in energy. Mostly we talk about high energies and therefore the molecules have the possibility to, to fragmentate, to decompose. And in the case of carbon dioxide, this will just end up that you not only have a molecular peak with the mass charge rate of 44, you can also fragmentate to CO plus oxygen, we will end up with 28 and 16, or even further to C plus O plus O, uh, and you have 12 and 16. So you see now you have already five mass numbers, 12, 16, 28, 22, and 44. But for one molecule, so already five signals, nah, it gets worse. Unfortunately, this is not the end because our nice elements have also isotopes and each of these isotopes has a certain percentage of presence and therefore you can combine all these mass numbers with isotoping pattern. So for instance, you have for the molecular peak not only 44, you have also in the same uh, ratio like here, for instance, 1% C430, you get also 35. So you will end up with a mass of signals for just one molecule and if you just remember or realize that we have here just CO2, just three atoms, quite small molecules still getting several signals out of it. Um, just imagine what happens if you have something complex, long chained hydrocarbons for instance, and when you mix them, you will end up with a mass of several signals. So for complex matrices, this is quite complicated to interpret. Nevertheless, it's still a good technique. And that's why let's talk a little bit how it is achieved from the technical part. Here we also have in principle two options, the transfer line coupling and the direct coupling, similar to the FTIR. For the transfer line coupling, this really similar. You have a heated outlet system on the furnace, you have a heated transfer line, and you have a heated inlet system in a mass spectrometer. <laughs> in this case, the transfer line is much longer in comparison to the FTIR system and the transfer line is much smaller in diameter, typically in a micrometer range, so 70, 50 micrometer, because the MS system has one special requirement. It must work in high vacuum conditions, so typically 10 to minus 6 millibar range. And our terminal analyzer is working at room pressure. So we need this long transfer line and the small diameter to achieve a pressure reduction from atmospheric pressure to the high pressure in the vacuum. Otherwise, the whole system will not work. Here on the screen, you see our new QMS Aeolus system, which is a quadrupole system. And this is more or less state of the art. So if you're looking for a new MS system, you're mostly looking for systems uh, in the thermoanalytic field with uh, mass scales up to 500 uh, mass numbers, mostly electron impact ionization, so AE sources, hopefully coated with um, yttrium oxide for more stabilization against oxidating atmospheres, heated inlet system, internal references. This is all what you in principle know. No need to know for a good system. On the other side, we have our uh, skimmer system, which is our direct coupling solution. Um, in this case, the MS sits also directly on top or more or less in the furnace um, of the thermal analyzer. This is a quite special approach and is not comparable to anything which we have discussed before because now we have here a so-called double orifice system. So we have two small micrometer large uh, holes inside of the system which will allow this pressure reduction from atmospheric pressure to a uh, high vacuum in a small um, area or small length. So typically in one round about two to three centimeters, you are able to reduce the pressure from the atmospheric to the high vacuum. And this allows to have this nozzle here in the middle part, which is the skimmer cone sitting directly inside of the furnace. 
And this is the main benefit of this approach, as the transfer system sitting inside of the furnace, it will be heated with the furnace. For this machine, furnaces up to 2000 degrees C are available, and therefore it means we have also transfer system temperatures of up to 2000 degrees C. So this machine can measure really high boiling things, it can measure even metallic vapors. And I will show you an example in some minutes. But before we come to this example, just start with a general one for the um, direct uh, for the transfer line coupling with the Iola system. So we see here um, the thermal treatment of neodymium sulfate, just a typical inorganic uh, compound consisting of neodymium, sulfate, anions, and some uh, crystalline water. And for the mass spectrometer uh, coupling, you typically end up with graphics like this, where you show the traces of certain mass number or mass charges. For instance, here the 18, the 32, and the 64. Um, and in the normal analyzer, you look on the spectras for each step, but at the end, you show this overview to just give an information what happens at each step. So for instance, here we see we have a response on the mass number 18, which is referring in our case here to water. So we have a water release in the first step, and in the further steps, we have responses for the 32 and the 64. And in this case, they are just referring to sulfur dioxide and oxygen. So you can just follow the decomposition steps and uh, get an insight into what happens at each of these steps. For a pure substance, this is maybe not the most interesting point, but if you think, for instance, about reaction analysis, it gets more and more useful. And therefore, let's look at the next graphic here. This graphic is the thermal synthesis of lithium mangan spinel, one of these common materials used as electrode materials in batteries. And in this case, we have just mixed up lithium carbonate and manganese oxide. Um, so, and then heated up. So and then the question is, we see here more or less three, two mass loss steps. So the first two are overlapping, strongly overlapping, and we have a final one beyond 600 degrees C. So the interesting point now would be at which temperature is my um, target substance is formed, at which temperature I would get the spinel a compound. Is it at 600 or is it at 1000? And therefore we combine this uh, analysis together with the mass spectrometer analyze on the outlet. And what you get here are responses for the mass 12, 16, 32, and 44. And for instance, the 44 and the 12 is referring to carbon dioxide coming from the carbonate. And the 32 and 16 is referring to oxygen coming from the oxide. And what we see in the first step, we have the decomposition of our carbonate and the reaction of our carbonate with the mangan oxide compound. So in principle, this is the formation of our spinel structure, while in the high temperature field beyond 600 degrees C, we see only a release of oxygen. And if we take this oxygen release into account with the observed mass loss steps, we see that the formation of the spinel in principle should be finished at around 600. And what we see afterwards is just the decomposition of our target substances, because here we now see already the oxygen release from the spinel structure and not any more, more the formation of the spinel structure. So with the help of the gas analysis, you get more information what happens at each point. And this allows a better interpretation what happens inside of this reaction mixture. Let's go to the final example here for the mass spectrometer coupling. And as already um, promised before, here is an example for this direct coupling solution, the skimmer coupling. And as mentioned, we have here high transfer temperature, and therefore we can even detect high boiling things like metal vapors. And in this case, we have here an application of lead telluride, which is one of the common uh, thermoelectric uh, materials. Unfortunately, this material has one uh, drawback. Um, if you heat it too high, for instance, beyond 600 degrees C, it will just start to evaporate. And this is seen here in the lower parts in the two graphs we see here. We have uh, in black again the TG curve, so we see the mass loss of the evaporation. And we see some signal responses from the mass spectrometer for different mass charges. In this case, its mass charge is 334, 336, and 338. And this is to show you that the 
isotopic pattern, which I mentioned before in a general part of the MS coupling, is really measurable. It's not just a basic general idea. You can really measure this isotopic pattern because here you see the main isotopes of lead and telluride, the main stable ones. So this is not all, just the main ones, but you can just mix them up and you will end up with these different masses you see here in the graph. So for instance, if you mix up lead 206 and telluride um, 128, you get to the 334 or 334 uh, mass to charge ratio. If you mix up um, 208 with 130, you get to the 338 and so on. So you can really see that you, first of all, due to the high transfer temperature, you can really measure these high boiling metallic vapors. And you can also detect this isotopic pattern. So you see here, we have really high sensitivity on this MS coupling. So far to the MS coupling, let's go to the last coupling for today, or the last technique, which is GCMS, standing for gas chromatographic MS combination. In this case, MS was already explained before. Now we have here the gas chromatographic uh, system. Gas chromatographic is nothing else than an analytic technique which separates complex mixture due to different chemical or physical interaction with the column system or with more or less the column filling the stationary phase. You see already here a small video running and inside there we inject a mixture of different um, gases at the same time. Here the blue, red and green balls and because they are interacting differently with the wall, with the filling of this column, they will go faster or slower passing through this column and therefore they can be separated. So you see, for instance, here, the blue one is more or less not getting in contact with the wall, while the green one is a little bit sticky and therefore they will be separated. At the end, and this is the main benefit of these techniques, you utilize this column as separation. These columns are quite long, typically 30 meters long. Um, because you can separate a complex mixture, at the end of this mixture, you end up with more or less single compounds, which can be then analyzed, for instance, with a mass spectrometer, and you get single compound spectra, where you can apply a database comparison. So you're getting quite easy interpretations in comparison to, for instance, the mass spectrometer technique, which I showed you before. If you there have a mixture, with all the mass numbers and all the fragmentation at the same time, you are more or less not able to distinguish what fragment is coming from what substances. But with the separation of a gas chromatograph in front of the detector system, you can get again single component spectra which are easily to interpret. Further on, this system still uses the high sensitivity of a mass spectrometer system and can be even enhanced by special um, experimental approaches like, for instance, cryotrapping. The drawback, of course, there are always drawbacks, is that this technique is in principle not a continuously traceable technique. This means I cannot continuously bring gases inside of this column because then you have no separation. You must have so-called distinct injections on this column system. Otherwise, you can't use this uh, separation approach I explained before. And therefore, it is a relatively slow measurement that requires special approaches for the coupling, which we will discuss now while we will have a look on the technical um, solution of this coupling. So you see here on the right side, a thermal balance system. In this case, it's a TG209 Libra system with a thermal chromatic line. We have a transfer line to transfer, again, the gases from the outlet of the thermal analyzer to our gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer. But between the gas chromatograph and our transfer line, we have a special coupling interface called Valvebox, which is achieving the combination of the continuously working thermal balance and the discontinuously working gas chromatograph. So how we achieve this interface or what is do inside of this interface? Inside of this interface, we have small loops around about 250 to 500 microliters in volume. These loops are heated because again, keep in mind, we don't want to have condensation because condensation is bad. So the whole interface is heated up to 330 degrees C. Inside of this interface, you have one or two loops depending on the um, solution. And these loops have one megabit traffic. We have no storage of gases for hours, so uh, we have no 
um, storage, we have a direct injection on the column. And how this injection is working, you see here on the lower part now a graphic. Um, so we will firstly connect our outlet gassing to this injection loop. This injection loop will be filled. So and the gases are then transferred to the outlet. So we're continuously filling this loop. And at a certain point of injection, we just switch this loop. And then the content of the loop is going to the column, going back, refilling, and so on and so on. With this help of this kind of valve system, um, it is possible to combine this continuously gas flow of the TGA and the discontinuous interaction or injection of the GC system. And as mentioned, you need special approaches. So what we are doing from the application side is that we just have our normal thermographic analysis. So we have our TG curve here shown in green on the top part. And you do distinct injection over the whole experiment. So typically, every two to four minutes, you make one of these injection movements. And then you get a response of the mass spectrometer for each of these injections over time. This allows you in principle at the end a nearly flow up in time flow up of uh, the decomposition reaction. So we make more or less a quasi continuous approach by just making repeatedly um, injection on the system. And for the evaluation, you just zoom in into one of these injections, for instance, here, the largest one in the middle part. And if we look there, we get our chromatogram, we can have a look on the mass spectrometer uh, spectras for each of these signal response peaks. And then you can make the database comparison. And you will see here several different compounds released. In this case, for this example, it was the decomposition, the pyrolytic decomposition of polycarbonate. So you see here all the polycarbonate decomposition products, for instance, here, uh, bisphenol A, um, which is quite known, well known one for the decomposition of polycarbonate. What you also see is that the separation, especially in the first part, is not so good as you would normally expect for a GC system. This is because we have injection on hot columns, um, mainly because we need to achieve a separation of the whole gases in a small time window. So in this case here, it's around about three to four minutes, because if we inject the next part on the column, we have or need to be sure that the previous injection has completely passed the column. Otherwise, you will mix up these injections and you don't know if the substance is referring to one or the second injection. Nevertheless, if you need precisely or more precisely uh, separation, you can go with a different approach on this um, kind of coupling. It's a so-called event approach where you only inject one times. Um, and in this case, it's a unique solution that you only go for distinct events, like for instance, the maximum of a DTG peak, and then you can prepare this injection on a separated GC analysis. This means you make a G separated GC program after the injection has occurred, and therefore you have the highest possibility of gas separation and best uh, uh, resolution of the gas separation. And you see here the same decomposition of a polycarbonate, so at the same time roundabout, like the one we have seen before. And with a separated um, GC furnace program, you can get a much better, more distinct separation, but still you get similar results in the part and you can now separate even similar components here in the beginning. Just to give you a realization how the evaluation is working, you just more or less double click on one of these peaks here, you get the spectra of this peak here shown in red and you compare it again, a library spectra in blue. So this is quite easy handling if you have achieved a good separation of all of your components inside of the gas chromatograph. With that, we are nearly coming to the end. Let's give me, let's give me the time for one more example now. Um, you see here um, aspartam reaction. So we thermally treat aspartam. Hopefully you know it. It's one of these sweetening compounds you mainly found in um, our foods. So for instance, I think most of you will know Coke Zero. So you have here the aspartam, for instance, inside there. And how is aspartam now reacting if you would heat it? Sometimes interesting uh, for processing of foods, for instance. And in this case, we have thermal treatment. We see um, a small mass loss step at the beginning. We see a second one and we see a third one. But 
as at the beginning mentioned, I don't know what happens in that phase. So I don't know what is referring to each of these Maslow steps. And therefore, we go again with our Wolf gas analysis, in this case, um, the GCMS coupling, and you will end up with this information about your Evolve gas analysis. So the first step, just showing one signal response. In this case, it's just the release of water. The second step is also a single uh, release response. In this case, it's methanol. And the last step is the main decomposition of the product um, with a complex release of different um, types of yeah, organic molecules. So you see here, you can really easily um, assign the causing or the origin of each of the Maslow steps um, with the help of a wolf gas analysis. With that, I'm more or less at the end. Let's summarize what we have talked about today. Um, first of all, I have shown you Evolve gas analysis in the common market field. So we have talked about FTIR coupling. We have talked about mass spectrometer coupling. I have shown you some examples for the GCMS coupling. So um, hopefully you now are a little bit familiar what are these couplings are, how they are working, what you typically can expect. But maybe the main question for you is, which is the one for me more or less? So let's have a last look overview here about different um, material kinds. And typically, if we're starting on biomass on the left side on organics and going to right side to metal alloys, cells and inorganics, you typically talk about um, progression of complex matrix on the organic field on the nature compounds to a few compounds in the inorganic field where you typically have distinct alloys or salt compositions. Um, therefore, for the few compounds, surprise, you are typically in a mass spectrometer field, high sensitivity, really stable systems, but as mentioned before, sometimes problem with complex matrices. So here, best point for uh, mass spectrometer systems. Um, you have the skimmer systems if you want to talk about metals and alloys because of his high boiling vapors. Of course, there are also some high boiling organics, so you have in principle also an application possible in the organic field for the skimmer system. Um, and FTIR, as we have seen the examples, going a little bit all over, going a little bit into inorganic field, like with ceramics or with topaz example, typically you end up in the polymeric field where you have not so complex system, but still um, uh, quite challenging one. And if you end up at the end with the biomass or really complex organic ones, you will go for the GCMS system. So hopefully with that one, you are now knowing yeah, maybe I will start with MS or FDR or GCMS, depending on what is my application field. With that, I'm really at the end. I hopefully have shown you that with the Evolve gas analysis, you get really an increasing importance because you get advantages in the evaluation of your thermal analytic results. The Evolve gas analysis is more or less a broad range of different systems, especially different detector systems, which are all have fair advantages and disadvantages and all have their uh, performance best places on different applications fields. And hopefully I have shown you with our application examples, what is the principal output? What is the benefit of an EGA system? With that, I can only go further and invite you to our upcoming uh, symposium about high affinity techniques or so coupling techniques in October in the northern of Bavaria. So if you're interested, just look here on the whole page, skt2018.com and get some more information. Maybe it's interesting for you to get just more information about Evolve Gas Analysis. With that, I'm now at the end. If you get further questions after the webinar, you can contact us by email or you can have a look on our homepage, netterminalanalysis.com. And now we will head over to the question answer session. So I will have a look if we have some questions. Yes, of course, we have many. Um, and first of all, the main question of every webinar. Um, yes, the principle, if you want to have the slides afterwards, you can contact us by the email um, shown on the screen. So, um, and where you get the PDF slides of this talk. So the next question is um, where it is. Uh, so how can we quantify the e hydrogen evolved gases out of a sample? Um, 
quantification in principle for all techniques, so for GCMS, FDIR coupling, or also GCMS coupling, is mainly based on calibration of your uh, evolved gas analyzer. So this means you firstly measure the substance of a known component release. So for instance, for hydrogen, you could make it quite easy. You just inject into your system a gas with a known hydrogen amount. Typically, you will work, for instance, with uh, Varigon, which is 5% hydrogen and argon. And based on this and possible mixing of this uh, hydrogen compound uh, content, you get more or less a calibration curve. So you ha have to know before a certain response signal, so you have one milliliter hydrogen released, is referring to a certain area of signal, and then you can apply this to a normal unknown sample. This is in principle standard procedure for calibration for all kind of these techniques. It's working in FDIR and MS the same way. We have a special um, a hardware approach for this. It's called Pulse TA. Where it's especially designed for gases, and in principle, it's working like the GCMS system. You have this loop system, and you will inject a distinct amount or volume of a gas, and you look just inside of the uh, response signal for the um, area of this known amount. So, next question, hydrogen, um, how we can detect hydrogen? Yeah, this is just um, based on um, what you want to do. So as mentioned, hydrogen is not possible with FTIR. So typically we'll go for MS systems. So you will attach a uh, mass spectrometer at the end of the outlet and just look for the mass to charge ratio referring to hydrogen. To surprise, this is mass to charge ratio too. And then you can detect hydrogen. If you need more information about this, um, on our homepage are some examples with hydrogen measurements on uh, the MS system. And also, if you want some further information about this, I can send you afterwards. Just give us a feedback on the email and you get some more information, especially for certain kind of uh, distinct gases. So not only hydrogen. If you have some other questions, for instance, for nitrogen oxide, for any other kind, just give us uh, an email afterwards because this can be uh, discussed more in detail on the distinct application field. Next question, how can you control the condensation of gases in the transfer line when they are heating at temperatures above 330 degrees? This is a common question um, because the transfer line, of course, has round about 300, 350, depending on the uh, combination. Um, but our measurements are, for instance, at 600 or 700 degrees. But you must always referring that this is the temperature of your solid sample or liquid sample, which you're more or less measuring. So you decompose a solid sample, for instance, a carbonate system. If you take calcium carbonate, it will decompose at 600, 700 degrees. But the gases which are produced by this decomposition reactions are, for instance, carbon dioxide. So it's a permanent gas. It will even be not condensating at room temperature. So you must always imagine that the transfer temperatures of the transfer lines are only referring to the gases boiling points, not the reaction temperature you are measuring inside of the thermal balance system. Um, so this means only for evaporation, like for this shown lead telluride, the temp temperature of the transfer system must be the same like uh, the system of the thermal balance. On all the other kind of applications, you are typically on the point that the produced or the, uh, the reaction products of uh, decomposition, for instance, or pyrolysis are having lower boiling points than the decomposition temperature, and therefore you can measure it. So to identify and quantify hydrogen fluoride in glaze material, which high levels of water with high levels of water, FTIR, QMS. So um, this is always like this. Um, in this case, this is always a special application for you. And we need to discuss this in more detail. As I mentioned, just send us an email. In this case, just for now, um, if you have high water traces releasing at the same time like the hydrogen fluorine, uh, FTIR is mostly not the best uh, option because FTIR is responding relatively strong on water signals with a broad band response, which is overlaying most other signals. However, if the hydrogen fluorine and the water release is coming at different temperature ranges, which you can easily test with a standard um, um, TG's measurement, 
then FDIR is completely sufficient to detect for hydrogen fluorine. It's more or less similar like to this topaz example I showed you. We only showed you of a high temperature region, which was 600 and beyond. However, there was still a water release at the beginning of around about 100 to 200 degrees C in this material. So if you have a strong uh, temperature separation of the releases, you can see it. If they're all coming at the same time, you're typically better with an MS system because you have mostly not so high overlaps with water and um, hydrogen flow in the MS system. Um, next question, um, how to deal with gas storage? If the gas is generated, generated is faster than the measuring speed. Uh, gas storage. So all the examples I showed you today are not referring to gas storage. So we ever continuously measuring. So this means in the FTIR and MS coupling, we continuously measuring um, with certain speeds. Um, and in the GC system, you have to go over with this um, quasi continuously mode, where you have round about if you are fast uh, time difference between each injections of about 15 seconds to 30 seconds in the fastest way, or you have these distinct injections uh, where you just lose all the other gases during the point where you're not inject. Um, for these high or fast generated gases, I would always prefer to go to a continuously measuring system, especially for instance, such an MS system where you can, for instance, select five or six, uh, five to 10 mass numbers. And if you have only, let's say 10 mass numbers you want to check, um, you can measure more or less every second is a complete spectra of these 10 mass numbers or even faster. Um, can even go down, for instance, to 100 milliseconds and you are such fast that I think you can see everything that is necessary to see. Ah, I see hydrogen is really the most interesting question today. Um, next question, hydrogen. Uh, is it possible to quantify hydrogen involved by water splitting? Uh, yes, this is possible. Um, we have also some application examples for this. So we will send you afterwards uh, maybe an application example for this one. But yeah, this is one of the common uh, ap applications for water hydrogen detection with the mass spectrometer system. So um, next question, how to control the pressure difference between the transfer line of MS and FDIR measurements? So yes, um, so um, in this case, as I mentioned, we can do both at the same time. And this is only working because um, the MS system is only using a small amount of gas. So we have, for instance, a gas flow of 100 milliliter at the outlet of our furnace. One milliliter is going to the MS because it will just take the small amount out of the gas flow and 99 milliliter will go to the FDIR. And therefore you have no pressure differences uh, between or inside of the transfer line. This is just the pressure to difference between the transfer line and the MS system, which is achieved by this long transfer line of the MS itself and the FDIR. So maybe the main point here is you will get two transfer lines. One is referring to the FDIR and one is referring to the MS system connected at the same time at the outlet of the furnace. So um, next one. Is it common to have detection of water through the whole FDIR result, even when heating to 600 degrees C? I have been using instrumental air and analyzes versus constructural materials, carpets, vinyl, everything. Um, this is maybe a general point for all uh, FDIR um, users. Um, FDIR is quite sensitive to atmospheric influences, like for instance, carbon dioxide and water. And therefore, you must always be aware that um, the FTIR system is either purged by a clean gas, typically uh, nitrogen, or inside of the spectrometers are typically um, some water and carbon dioxide absorbing materials. And if you will always see um, water inside of your measurements, even if there in principle should be no one, um, it is mostly an indication that you just have to um, change or, uh, or maintain your system regarding this um, Ava perch gas or with absorption materials. Just have a look there. Mostly this will solve your problem. Okay, with that, 
I see we have some more questions. Uh, I will try to answer them afterwards, but now we are more or less uh, one hour past. So I will now close this live session here. Um, don't be afraid, I will try to answer all the questions which are still open here. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the webinar up to now and keep on. We will have some more in the futures. Thank you for attending and goodbye.